Welcome everybody to today's SMPT Standards Update webcast. This is going to be a very exciting webcast. Our speaker is going to talk about an industry initiative that uh, should have a great impact on uh, the industry. Uh, you'll see that the three organizations that are collaborating in this initiative um, really uh, have, have a vision for uh, our industry going, going forward. Um, I I am your host, Joel Welts, SMPTE's Director of Education. Welcome. We are at the top of the hour. Today's speaker is Mr. Felix Poulin. He is the Senior Engineer, Technology and Innovation at EBU. and uh, He's going to tell us about the Joint Task Force Initiative that uh, EBU, VSF, and SMPTE have um, collaborated on. Uh, Felix, uh, without further delay, uh, you should be able to click on that slide and take over control. Thank you, Joel. Can you hear me well? Hear you very well. Wonderful. So, uh, as you as you said, and I want also to thank you uh, and the CMT to to provide the, this uh, opportunity to talk about this. Uh, I think important work, and I think it's very timely because we recently last week at the Vitrans conference we announced the phase two of the task force. So. We'll be able to talk a little bit more about this and to also answer the questions people may have uh, about about it since we we have not talked a lot uh, about it uh, already. So uh, I'm uh, working at the EBU and I'm the lucky person in the, in charge of uh, looking after this very uh, challenging uh, topic of network media production. I'm involved with the task force since the beginning of it, uh, and I, I help uh, the work of it. So I should be able to reflect at best possible uh, what we have done so far. But I will also put a little bit of my opinion in it uh, to to show the, the direction I think it's uh, it's taking. So normally I change a slide here. Yeah, exactly. Great. So, three parts of this presentation uh, about network media. First of all, to give a little bit of background, uh, I want to make the point that uh, we're talking much more than just replacing SDI by IP here, and I will explain why. And I will give uh, a recap of what we have done in phase one and why uh, with the task force and where does this task task force come from and also I will talk about the phase two that is uh, soon to be started it was announced last week so replacing SDI by IP in the studio um, of course when we say that we mean uh, SDI and all the other professional interfaces and signals that we are using in our live production plant, uh, including audio, AES MADI, uh, the time and sync, uh, uh, the, the black burst, the, the time code, uh, any serial control, the use of cross point router. So this is what SDI means. It's lot larger than this, just SDI. And when we say IP as well, usually we, we mean in a larger uh, context. Uh, we talk about packet networks in general, uh, including inter Ethernet uh, layer 2. And we're talking about using uh, commodity uh, high T uh, equipment, switches, server storage. So this is one way to see that. And this is a little bit a way to, to continue to preserve the production model we are, uh, we are using uh, nowadays. And, and then if we go in that direction, we can talk about uh, many benefits. Uh, probably uh, most of you already seen a presentation about this topic, already seen that image. Uh, that is a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, not so honest because I'm sure many people can do better and cleaner uh, setup than that but the idea here is that we could carry all the different signals uh, from the essence to the metadata to the control and synchronization over the same infrastructure 
uh, that, that that is a clear benefit of, of this approach. The other uh, part is the idea of the, that we can aggregate signals. Um, if we take the example of a, an HD signal um, using a one gig Ethernet with some compression, mezzanine compression, we could carry a number of, of HD signals and it's in, in both direction because it's a bidirectional uh, when we think about Ethernet. Uh, uh, and 10 gig Ethernet then can uh, enable uncompressed uh, video uh, or much more of compressed signals. And if we look a little bit into the future, we, we think about uh, UHD formats. So as an example is the quad HD resolution with 120 frames uh, or divided by 1001 or whatever, but it's about 24 gigabit uh, uncompressed um, signal. So now we need to look after more 10 gig with some compression and uh, 40 gigs uh, and more if we want to use uncompressed video at that stage. But this is the idea that over the same infrastructure uh, we can scale and we can, uh, we can uh, aggregate a number of signals. Felix, we have a question. Would you like to take it? Sure. Um, the question is, what is your opinion of AES67, and in parentheses, level 3 routing of audio over IP? <laughs> so, maybe we, we better to come back later when I, I come to the, 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 the gap analysis uh, where we have a list of technologies that we can uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, this this is part of it for sure. Uh, this is one possible solution. Uh, the AES67. So let's come back later. Maybe you remind me, Joel, when we when we get uh, to the gap analysis section. Happy to do that. So if I continue on the track of uh, SDI versus IP. Um, the big question here is, is why changing because SDI, it works. Uh, it's exa exactly what we need to do live production. Uh, it's an open, widely adapted standard or, or standards if we take into account the different flavors of SDI. Uh, plug and play, huh? it's simple, easy, straightforward, one cable, one signal, uh, very low bit error rate, very low latency. Uh, bandwidth is always there. Uh, SMT is working on, on, on new, uh, higher bandwidth uh, for, for UHD formats. So, so it's there, it's working, and uh, we are wondering if IT uh, technologies can do the same. The other question is uh, about, so, one, one exercise here is a diction exercise is to say that very quickly, cuts equal cost cuts. So let's try it, try it at your place. It's not so, so easy. I had to, with my French Canadian accent, I had to practice many times to be able to do that. Uh, cuts, when we say cuts, it's commodity of the shelf. Um, the idea of be able to uh, go to uh, uh, commodity hardware uh, of switch and IT equipment and be able to build a, a studio out of it. Um, and to take the benefits of this huge market that is the IT industry compared to the niche market of broadcast industry. So this is a little bit of hope uh, of many users to, to, to reduce their cost by doing that. Uh, but there's a question mark. Uh, we have to prove that and we have also to prove that we can really use commodity of the shelf. Uh, we will see that we are using very demanding uh, application and sometimes you will probably need the high-end devices, uh, the best switches, the best uh, servers and storage to be able to do that. So. There's another way to see the same problematic, the same, uh, the same challenge of moving from SDI to IP. It's, it's the, the point of view of the users and the point of view of imagining 
do the exercise of imagining a few years, uh, five years, uh, the, 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 the changing business and where, it, where it's going, and how can we adapt to this uh, reality. And stop for a moment thinking about the current model. Uh, let's try to dream a little bit what's going on. So, first of all, if we, we take the point of view of the viewer, the end user, the, the customer, the, the one that is using the content uh, that, that we broadcasters are, 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 are creating for them, uh, we uh, the customer, the, 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 the consumer electronic industry is promising a lot of great things uh, for, for them and, and we're talking about enriched content, the second screen application, the new formats, uh, the, the contextual and, and live interaction and the possibility to, to compose your own uh, media environment and, and more and more platform, always new ones and everything. So. Uh, this is what what where we are going cl clearly, and and to be able to do that, uh, the content creator need to be able to to provide the content, and and so he need uh, he need basically a lot of flexibility in the workflows, uh, a lot of collaborative, uh, remote, distributed, uh, automated uh, workflows, and 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 the new user interfaces to build that content and uh, so it's about flexibility for the content creator uh, be able to quickly uh, adapt maybe on a on a show basis or on a program or even on a uh, based on the, on the current uh, context while we are operating in these businesses since many years with with quite static uh, models a control room uh, environment is is quite the same uh, since many years, and uh, it's quite rigid when it's time to to change a little bit uh, the, the method of working. Um, to to be able to do uh, that to to get that flexibility, now the the, the system builder uh, need to to fulfill that uh, those needs and and and. and uh, Will rely uh, much more on the agility uh, to to provide a resource on demand and uh, resource that can be uh, distributed and reallocated. And um, so, this projection in the future uh, exercise tell us that uh, to be able to produce multiple contents uh, for the viewer, uh, the content creator need the flexibility and the system builder, the system designer need to be able to to quickly uh, provide these systems and this become more obvious that this is the IT and networks uh, technologies that are uh, adapt, more adapt to do that, to achieve that. And then when we accept this uh, Maybe we can do the exercise to come back to the basics and try to see what today we can do and what we want to preserve in terms of functionality, reliability, uh, performance, and try to reproduce that. Uh, if we just start from the beginning by just trying to move SDI over IP, for instance, maybe uh, we cannot get all the flexibility we need at the end. So this is a bit... Uh, uh, one way uh, I propose to see the problem and also uh, one way the, uh, the task force that I will now talk about uh, has taken um, to approach the problem. So is there any question at this point because I will jump into the meat of the task force at this point. There are no additional questions at this time. Great. Uh, maybe I was clear enough or maybe uh, you keep the question for uh, this part because we talk about before the task force uh, there was a uh, meeting organized uh, about a year ago um, by the VSF uh, hosted in Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta uh, uh, with 35 uh, participants from the industry, the different 
from broadcasters and networks and, and manufacturers, some consultants from, from standard bodies. Uh, so it was a very open discussion led by Brad Gilmer and uh, Richard Friedel, and they invited uh, us. I was in the room, uh, some broadcasters from Europe, but, and, and a lot of people from uh, North America. Uh, Business-driven discussion about the use of packetized network in professional media applications. That was the scope of this discussion. Uh, a lot of workshop, a lot of presentations. Uh, three key points I uh, noted at the end of, the, of this meeting was uh, it was a kind of a consensus in the room that to be able to achieve uh, a fully network production environment we will absolutely need to be able to mix and match product from different vendors. Uh, we need interoperability. It's a, it's a key for success here. And uh, the discussion converged that the best way to achieve that was to coordinate the effort of the different players in the industry. Uh, try not to reinvent the wheel each in our corner, but try to work together to uh, to our benefit and because the competition and the challenge ahead is not really in the room it's the competition against uh, the new media uh, that are coming into the landscape of the, the broadcaster and the content creator that, that we, uh, we represent and uh, by working together we can adapt to this, this change. Um, so it was a grade and it was also a grade that there was a kind of an urgency to act because uh, a lot of proprietary solution are, are being developed and we, if we want to achieve interoperability probably we need to, um, to intervene as soon as possible in the discussion. Uh, so that, that was the, the key reason why we, we wanted to start this and oops, this is the um, the creation of the joint task force by EBU, uh, so Association of uh, European Broadcasters, uh, uh, SMT that you you should know uh, on the skull and and the VSF. Uh, in April last year, uh, so the, the goal to help manage the transition from specialty broadcast equipment uh, um, um, interfaces to IP packet based network. And there's currently around 234 participants on the uh, reflector. Uh, it's still time to register. If you are not, it's very open. Uh, I, can, I will give you the information to, to do so if you are not on the list already. Um, and there's also this link to the website where you can find all the documents and the different communications that was done in, in the last year. So behind the task force, there's a core administration team uh, who is uh, giving the, the, the direction. Uh, so co-chairs from the three sponsor organization, Brad Gilmer, uh, executive director of VSF, Richard Friedel from Fox, president of VSF, Hans Hoffman from UU, Peter Simes from SMT, and uh, myself and Bob Rule from VSF. Uh, we, we are the people who uh, each week are, uh, are talking to, to set the, the timeline and uh, organize the logistics uh, of the meetings and everything. So the phase one uh, that was done uh, last year, uh, three steps. First step, user requirements. That was done in June. I will give more details. Uh, request for technology in September, and then a gap analysis report in December. So the collection of user requirements. Uh, it was an open call uh, asking for um, to provide a kind of a user perspective and a business-driven perspective. So the, everybody has to provide user stories using that template as a um, content creator, as a broadcaster, as a video operator, a cameraman, or any kind of role, 
involved in creating uh, distributing content. I want to do something uh, so that I have some business value out of it. And we collected, uh, we received uh, 35 contributors, uh, proposed 136 uh, stories. And these were grouped into 17 super stories, so groups uh, of related stories. And there was a report published in June 2013. And when I was explaining earlier that uh, it was interesting to go and, and have a little bit of future looking of what, wh where the industry wants to go and, and is going to go. It, it, it's a bit the idea behind this is go back to basics. Don't think too much in terms of technical requirement, but think, think in terms of the business, what we are doing and what we want to be able to do in a few years. And uh, this is where a lot of indication about the needs for flexibility, the needs for uh, having a real-time uh, metadata, having a, uh, a lot of possibilities and flexibilities to be able to do that. And since we, we did that, uh, the next step was to ask the industry uh, what technologies do you have or are you working on that can address those this list of user requirements? And uh, th th this uh, RFT was published uh, by IBC last year, uh, so last September, and um, there was a deadline to respond. Um, so again, uh, a small group of, of colleagues have, have worked on, on drafting that, uh, that request for technology. There was a couple of meetings. Uh, Q&A meeting uh, in London and in, at the IBC. Uh, and then finally we receive uh, the response uh, that were um, uh, summarized in the gap analysis uh, report. So roughly um, a gap analysis report uh, it it re uh, answer finally one one question that can be uh, what are the bits and pieces of the solution? Uh, it provides a list of technologies that can address those user requirements. Um, we got six, 66 technologies submitted from 27 respondents. Uh, the list is there. And um, this uh, exposes a little bit the, the coverage of user requirements. Uh, so how much of the user requirements are, are addressed. Um, and it provides a summary of individual responses. Um, so the responses are, the level of detail are really different from one response to the other. So by providing a kind of a high level response summary of each of them, and also by providing a link so you can download the full package of each responses. Uh, if uh, you want to get more details, some of them have uh, white papers, technical documentation, and you can dig a little bit more into their technologies. Uh, some uh, are, are kept very high level, so you won't learn much more than what is written in the, in the summary. Uh, but one thing that was clear, it was not a competitive analysis at this point, comparing uh, s uh, solutions. So it was really a list of different technologies, and basically it was the claim of the proponent how they, they can address the different user requirements. We did not test that validated the, the, the response. Uh, so the interpretation also of the user requirement may vary from one to the other. So you need to, you need to take that into account when you read uh, the report also. Uh, some observations from this report. First of all, the, there's a good response rate, uh, 66, uh, 66 technologies, 27 respondents. So uh, 
it gives an indication of, of on the interest uh, for this topic. Uh, and a mix of broadcast and some IT uh, vendors show also that the IT industry is, seems to be interested by our segment uh, of, of, of their big business. Uh, basically, it's it's a preview of future network media infrastructure. You, you, you don't have all the technologies, but probably a big part of the technologies of tomorrow's infrastructure are in the report. Uh, some major vendors are missing. They decided to not participate. They were not aware. I don't know. They, it's their choice. Uh, so it's not 100 percent, but still probably a wide coverage of what what uh, what will be uh, tomorrow's infrastructure. Um, and one big conclusion is that it, it's, it was not possible with those answer and the, the framework of this uh, RFT to analyze, uh, evaluate the interoperability between the different technologies. It was not the goal uh, and it was not possible to do that at this point. Now, like when we do that kind of exercise, sometimes it raises more questions than it answers questions. Uh, many questions remaining uh, open. Uh, so there's clearly a big, yes? Uh, Joel, did you want to? Oh, okay, I heard something weird in my ear. So. No, that was not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Ethernet or IP? So the, there's clearly a big uh, debate now going on about different technologies. Uh, the layer two, uh, including Ethernet EVB, uh, or uh, layer three, so IP with some network management, maybe some software defined networking. Um, so that there's clearly uh, two offers or more, because uh, these are the biggest one, but there's also proposition from for other kind of next generation protocols, uh, layer three protocols that that can also address uh, the kind of needs that we usually have for producing content like the synchronicity and uh, the bandwidth reservation and those kind of features. So there's a big debate uh, going on. And it's a very interesting debate because you can challenge the proponent of these two uh, or more approaches and you can learn a lot uh, about uh, their vision and how, how we can solve the problem. So is it one or the other or both of them that will uh, at the end provide a solution? This is open. We don't have the answer in this exercise so far. Uh, commodity IT, or do we need kind of media where uh, flavors of, of, of those equipment? Um, because many of these protocols that are, uh, that seems to address many of the requirements are not necessarily implemented in all of the, of the switch. And you need to select carefully uh, which equipment you 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 choose? Uh, Precision time protocol is an example that seems to be um, that that seems to be that come back a lot in in the discussion. But then there's a there's a question about which profile and what is supported by the switch, uh, and also. Um, the fact that for PDP, and it's a point I have here, for PDP, there's many profiles. So it's a huge standard. It's IEEE 1588. There's many options, and there's different profiles that are currently proposed by the AES 67. Uh, AVB is using another uh, slightly different uh, profile. And the work of SEMT Time and Sync is, is also uh, working on a profile and standardizing this. And uh, probably there's a there's a need for harmonization at some point uh, to make sure that these also are uh, supported by the uh, the equipment manufacturers. Um, network management. So there's clearly, if we think about SDI, a need for a kind of a 
plug and play zero configuration. Uh, we don't want to to be forced to run every time we plug a new camera in or a new device, be forced to run into exhaustive, uh, extensive configuration uh, with a lot of expertise required to do that and a lot of risk to to uh, to put the network into uh, instability. So how to get a de deterministic behavior out of, of the networks and, and to get plug and play. So there's some proposition in the gap analysis to get there. AVB has a particular approach, for instance, for uh, automatic negotiations. Uh, and on the IP uh, layer also, there's a, a number of, of protocols that exist, that are there, that are not necessarily totally new. Uh, it's good to know that it seems to be possible to get there. Uh, soft uh, service-oriented architecture for live, would it be a suitable approach? Because uh, FIMS, which is uh, pretty, at the moment, pretty much batch and file-oriented uh, so far, uh, could be interesting to see if this could be a good approach for uh, live services, for live production. So, uh, old discussion, an old discussion, which is embed versus separate audio metadata uh, video. Um, is the SDI over IP the way to go? Because there's some proposition. Think about SMT 2022-6, that is a carriage of um, video, uncompressed video, basically the SDI payload over uh, RTP, UDP, IP. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when we think about the migration and the transition to the from the current infrastructure. But there's also other propositions. Uh, like the BBC uh, R&D have proposed a flows and grain uh, architecture where the, the different elements, uh, whether it be audio, video, uh, metadata, can be uh, at a very fine granularity, can be time stamped, so you can think of a video frame or even an audio sample or group of sample uh, that can be time stamped at the creation and then uh, presented at the other end of the network in the right order, but then you less rely on the synchronicity of the network, while in SDI, for instance, you you think about a network that, that must be uh, kind of constant bandwidth to be able to, to, to get uh, the video flow correctly at the other end. So there seems to be uh, there also different approaches, one that is more uh, uh, legacy uh, and others that also are thinking in terms of taking the uh, the natural behavior of, of, uh, of an IT uh, or network and uh, the protocols that, that are uh, in use in, in this domain more natively. So this is an interesting debate also, I think, and, and there's a lot of discussion about this. Uh, another old uh, debate, I think every time we come up with new format that require more bandwidth, uh, we think about the possibility to use some kind of light compression in the studio. And then after a couple of years, uh, the infrastructure can support more bandwidth and then we don't have to talk about it anymore. So it's a little bit the same here. Uh, it depends a lot on the speed of adoption and uh, of the different network uh, uh, infrastructure and, and for instance, 10 gig Ethernet seems to become affordable. 40 gigs still a bit expensive, 100 gig probably we don't even think about it for now. Uh, but then what it will be in three years when we start deploying those things and in five years when the maturity uh, of these products uh, become more more tested and proven. So uh, there's this debate 
also and proposition for some kind of light compression uh, Tico is a proposition JPEG 2000 uh, also uh, and of course HEVC uh, intra frame for instance for UHD monitoring and control uh, this is another area where harmonization is very very wished here because there's a few uh, proposition that doesn't seem to uh, interoperate pretty well at the moment. Open Control uh, Alliance, as as proposed, uh, is system in the task in the gap analysis in the RFT. Uh, there's the work uh, from SMT to. T for CS is it the group uh, I don't know the name of the standard uh, but this is uh, probably overlapping a bit and and also uh, Hamburg plus that that is promoted by some organization as well so here it will be uh, very very interesting to to see how these uh, these things work can work together to not end up with too many different uh, solutions that would not talk to to each other media over uh, enterprise network or dedicated network uh, managed by the IT department or managed by the broadcast team or maybe we, we should not think in these those terms maybe the, the team should be integrated so a lot of questions <laughs> sorry about that and maybe maybe I could uh, stay there because this could be a place where some people <laughs> would like to add something here well we do have a, a couple of um, questions in the queue and audio questions are also welcome so far all of our questions have been text so if you'd like to ask an audio question please type I have an audio question using the same question box and we'll take the questions in the order that they're received but uh, back to uh, a couple of questions that came in early on asking about uh, technology and uh, the first one was from Jim um, what what is your opinion of AES AES 67 level 3 routing of audio over IP so opinion I, I don't like in this context I don't like to to you know to to give a strong opinion about what is good and what is not good uh, because we need to be very open at this point of all the different possibilities but there's certainly it's a it's a very promising standard in terms of uh, a lot of of requirements are about uh, using uh, facilities uh, in a wider scope than just inside the, the studio and to to connect together uh, different studios different campuses different location even around the world and in this uh, IP seems to be more adapted than for instance a layer 2 uh, approach so um, now the question is can we use maybe layer 2 in the studio uh, layer 3 bridges between uh, island of layer 2 maybe this it's a possibility and, and there's some proposition about it uh, to go in that direction um, AES 67 uh, I think it's a kind of the next is a continuation of AES 3 and MADI and uh, but over networks so in terms of functionality to address a lot of uh, of needs um, over a good managed network uh, it's interesting but the challenge in, is in the management of the network then uh, and this is not addressed pretty clearly yet how can we get the, the kind of deterministic performance uh, and the low latency and all those requirements we need uh, in an IP network um, so I think this is more about about this the challenges in the in the network management here okay um, and, and relating to your layer 2 layer 3 uh, comments uh, Matthew asks how does HD based T technology 
fit into the SDI versus IT discussion? So, from what I understand of HD base T, it's more or less uh, kind of HDMI over Cat5. I think it's more consumer uh, than uh, technology. Um, then why not using it in the studio? Uh, probably we're talking more here about even lower than layer two. We're talking about a physical layer, which is the, the category five. Uh, yes, the requirement for using a maximum of commodity equipment, and then uh, we're looking for uh, layer two or layer three. Uh, technologies. Um, unless some, somebody else know better about HD based T, but this is what I understand from it. And it was not something that was proposed in the, as a technology. Okay, and uh, the notorious uh, VOIP um, kind of dropped some packets along the way, but what I took from what I could understand was that. Um, uh, perhaps it was uh, it's more on the consumer side and that it was not proposed is, is that the bottom line yeah and also that uh, also that it's not rootable or uh, you cannot mix it with uh, standard uh, switches got it got it okay um, we do have a couple of uh, other questions if you want to continue the presentation and we'll save those two for the um, Q&A period yeah okay so, next logical steps from, from that. We have a bunch of technologies uh, that can address the, 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 the requirements. Uh, now, we would like to know how these uh, bits and pieces fit together in the big picture. How can, we, uh, how can we design a system using all those technologies? And then, it will help us also to identify uh, what are the points of interoperability in the system where we could uh, uh, find standard, the needs for standard interfaces and new standards probably. So, in order to, to do that, uh, the, the phase two of the JTNM that was announced uh, last week during the VITTRANS conference. Um, so, the goal is to facilitate the discussion about uh, coming up with a common model that can be established for packet-based network infrastructure and to make those infrastructure interoperable. Uh, we're talking about a kind of a reference architecture uh, that could be used uh, in order to design a system uh, that could be used in order to map the different technologies that we have gathered in the first phase. And to kick off this work, uh, there's a doodle in progress to find a date for a, a meeting. Uh, so time frame is around the end of April and uh, location probably on the east coast of the US. Uh, it, if you are on the JTNM reflector, normally you have uh, received this uh, doodle uh, invitation. Uh, otherwise, uh, in a few slides, I will have the, the information how you can get registered to this. And then uh, get the information. Uh, so that this meeting will be announced probably uh, within a week, uh, once we get the. Uh, the winning date from the doodle. So, this is to join the task force. It's about email 
rule one of Verizon.net, bar rule from the VSF is maintain this uh, mailing list. So it's as easy as that, drop him an email, be on the list, uh, be informed of the next steps, the meetings, uh, And, and that's more or less. I wanted to to make the point that it's more more just replacing is the I by IP. It's a lot of opportunities, a lot of way, uh, big opportunity to adapt to the biz, the change of the business. Uh, that we are uh, we gather many pieces of the puzzle. You have a report uh, that you can use as a reference. Uh, but now we need to, tim to think about system uh, perspective and uh, how we make it work uh, and how we can get maximum interoperability in our systems. So that's what uh, the phase two is about. So here we are. Terrific. To Yes, we are now in our Q&A period. Thank you, Felix. Um, very interesting discussion. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, I invite our guests to um, add their questions to, uh, to our list. We're very happy to present them. Um, I encourage you to um, be brave and ask an audio question if you'd like. Um, I will uh, you know, find you and unmute you and we'll, uh, you can ask your question directly to Felix. Uh, let's see, Felix, um, one question from Eric is, um, do you think we will have to deal with hybrid architecture for a while, legacy, you know, SDI, IP, and what does that mean to the uh, control application layer? So clearly, clearly yes, huh? the, yeah, there will be transition, there will be uh, migration path, uh, so we have to think about this, of course. Uh, when I, I propose to look into the future and what kind of business we, we are going to have in a few years, I think once this is done, and this is a bit the, uh, the goal of the, the, the collection of user requirements we have done, uh, and once we have a reference architecture of tomorrow, we, we need to also uh, think about bridging uh, the current application and also uh, how, how we can uh, progressively uh, migrate and, uh, and exchange between uh, a new infrastructure and a, and a legacy infrastructure that will be the case. Uh, control, uh, I, I guess it's, I mean, it won't be much different than any time in the past there was a migration uh, where you need some adapters, you need uh, you need some uh, uh, glue uh, between uh, the new technology and uh, the, the, the old, let's say, technology. Um, control, in particular, I I think it's the case for synchronization. Is the case for all the video formats. Uh, and control as well. So uh, we, we need to, to, to make it a success. We need to have those uh, bridging technologies. And good news is that in the gap analysis, there's a bunch of technologies that are, uh, that are going into that direction, thinking about this transition, uh, including, I think, uh, the 2022-6, that is clearly the SDI over IP. So there's no big transformation uh, it's the SDI payload that is carried over IP, uh, so it's a, it's one example of a transition uh, uh, technology. Now the question is, will it will it be the definitive uh, approach, or is there another approach uh, that 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 doesn't need to take into account uh, the legacy? Uh, but the thing is, in our industry, I think we have carried a lot of legacy uh, since uh, since forever. Uh, I think about the draw frame or the interlace or those kind of uh, uh, of tricks. Uh, 
uh, uh, that are still there. So we'll probably continue to have uh, some compromise like that to do. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Angelo. I believe Angelo's in Italy. Uh, Angelo asks um, one remaining question is uh, related to archival and the use of AXF. Is uh, AXF uh, uh, being considered? So this, I think it's a bit out of scope in, in this exercise because what we're trying to do here is to, to talk about the infrastructure itself and not much about the application. Uh, so how we can uh, mix live and file base over the same infrastructure, for instance. But we don't. We have not touched a lot about the wrappers, uh, the application itself, uh, the metadata schemes, and those kind of things. It, it, it's not really what we're discussing here. Um, I think once we can on the same uni unified infrastructure do live and file base uh, you can do AXF, you can do whatever you need to do uh, but uh, it's not really the goal of, of, of this exercise. Oh, okay. We do have um, an audio question if you're up to taking it. Sure. Totally. Okay. Uh, let's see. Phil, um, you have the floor. Ah, thank you very much. I, I've got a very simple question, um, but I think I'd like, rather put it verbally than in writing. Uh, Felix, you rightfully identified that interoperability is a, a key factor in all of this. From the gap analysis, have you been able to identify how far down the interoperability track the various manufacturers and interested bodies were uh, that responded to you. My sensation generally is that there are several uh, committed manufacturers who are seeking to establish their particular flavor of networking as the de facto standard, as has happened pl plenty of times in the past, of course. Um, but uh, how do you feel that's, uh, that's sitting? So I think you're right. Uh, from the gap analysis, it's very hard to say uh, the the interoperability between those uh, groups of technologies. Uh, AVB, for instance, comes uh, a few times in the from different proponents. Uh, and, and then uh, some other talk about SMT 2022-6. Uh, as the, the video uh, carriage over IP. Uh, there's a very few that talk about how we can uh, use these different technologies in the same environment. Some some proposed, some approach, but it was very hard to send. That's why the phase two. The phase two is really about thinking in terms of systems and thinking in, in terms of where we need the interoperability between the systems. Uh, it was the limitation of the, the phase one is was 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 hard to to say that. But yes, we we, we see that there's a, a two at least or three four uh, different groups or trend of doing the same thing. And of course, we would like to have ultimately uh, one way of doing it, or at least that these different approach uh, can be bridged together. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, what about AVB? Is this one of the proposed technologies? Yes, it is. Uh, it was proposed by uh, more than one proponent. Um, it's there. Uh, I think anyone who has uh, read a little bit about AVB, uh, you won't learn a lot from, from the gap analysis um, because it's well documented and it's well uh, 
communicated so far. Um, so yeah, the, it's there. It's not the only approach. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, next question. Um, can um, SOA media like FIMS and live streaming coexist? That, that's a question I have. Um, I think um, we certainly uh, need a kind of a framework if we want to achieve interoperability. We need a kind of a framework of interface at the software level. Um, so naturally we think about FIMS as a framework like that for the, the file based environment and how, how FIMS could make could be made uh, uh, modified or, or added some features to uh, to achieve the, the kind of timing constraint we have in live production but th this is a question I have Personally, I would like to have the answer. Uh, maybe if there's a FIMS uh, expert in the room, you could help. Uh, I don't know exactly what would need to be done to make it uh, it work, or if it's ultimately adapted or suitable for this application. Right. Next question, and I think this is the next to the last question. Uh, it's from Bob, and Bob asks, do you think COTS devices will be in most cases disqualified for use based on latency and uh, QoS requirements for live video? I think maybe we can turn this around. Uh, we could have a number of requirements that would make that if, if a switch passed those requirements, then it's suitable for the application. Uh, I don't have the feeling that you can uh, go eyes shut in the store and buy any switch, you will get the performance you need for sure. Uh, I think you need to, to, do, your, to do some tests and, and, and to make sure that the different protocols you're using are supported uh, the latency, the backbone memory of the switch. Um, so it doesn't seems that you, you need a bit more than just a cut switch. You need a cut switch that can do the job. Uh, that, that's what I, I, I feel. And, and the other way, maybe you will have some vendor that will come up with some switches that that are tested for the application and they will uh, and then it will ease the work uh, in selecting but then you are a bit away from the dream of cuts uh, pure cuts uh, infrastructure Yoshi has a follow-up comment uh, about his FIMS question uh, he says it would be wonderful if we can apply the FIMS concept to live and then our next question is from Dan uh, two questions actually. Um, how does timing work with IP based sources? How will tri level and genlock be replaced? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it, it, it could be a full uh, full webinar. I think you, you had one on this, did you? Uh, so the work of the SMT uh, on time and sync, uh, that is a very important work uh, and to, to, to answer that question. Uh, the, the PTP, Precision Time Protocol, it's an IT uh, standard, uh, IEEE 1588. Uh, it's a way to distribute a clock uh, very precisely on a network so all your devices are the same at the same time. A little bit like the NTP uh, clock uh, that your uh, computer is using to synchronize this clock. Uh, to a central server uh, or, or phones, um, uh, PTP is just it is more precise, uh, especially when you're using uh, equipment switches that that are uh, supporting all the features of it. Uh, so once you have uh, everybody on the on the same clock, uh, you can send uh, information of switching. Uh, that, that this precise time you need to switch uh, and then you get more or less the functionality of a, of a black burst uh, signal. Um, 
but then again, it's a in, in the small details you you could have a full uh, full class, and I'm not an expert in this. Excellent, and that was our last question. Um, thank you, Felix, for a very uh, terrific presentation. I uh, hope uh, our guests found it uh, useful. I think they will. I hope you also attract new members to the uh, Joint Task Force, which again I hope you do. Um, so I would like to thank you again, Felix, our guests, uh, and uh, everybody who supports SIMTI, EBU, and VSF. Um, this it does conclude our webcast for today, and uh, I hope we will see you next time on SIMTI standards updates and Simpty Monthly Webcast. Thank you very much and uh, take care. Thank you very much.